insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 11, Endgames and Paydays. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my lovely and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Michelle? A little misty-eyed now. (laughs) Always gets me, no matter how many times I see it. Yes, this is uh, uh, Avengers... End game weekend. We haven't seen it yet. <laughs> no, we have not seen it. We see it tomorrow. Actually, 24 hours from right now, we will be in the theater getting ready to ball our eyes out. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, very exciting. Uh, first thing we're going to be talking about today uh, is some Avengers End Game mm-hmm. reactions, uh, some news. Uh, in our Disney Detective segment, uh, then we'll be talking about uh, some rather uh, heated comments that have been made about Bob Iger and his uh, salary and compensation. Then we have an update on Disney's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and uh, some restrictions that people were not expecting to have to endure. Then we'll move into our entertainment news. We'll talk a little bit about the new James Bond movie that was announced. They announced the details. Uh, Then we have uh, some new albums coming out from uh, some folks we haven't heard from in a while. Mm -hmm. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Are we ready? Yes, we are. So, uh, Disney Detective, go, Ma- uh, Michelle, for Disney Detective. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, Avengers Endgame premiered uh, a few days ago, um, and the initial reactions have been obviously very favorable. I think out of 
everyone that I personally know that has has seen it, there's actually only been one person who didn't like it, and I don't think he is a Marvel fan to begin with, so, you know. You, you can't <laughs> not like it, and, and you can't not be a Marvel fan right. and not like it, I think, right. is the exactly. gist. So, uh, some initial reactions. Kevin Smith, obviously, you know, everyone knows he's a huge Marvel fan. He got choked up uh, watching Captain Marvel and seeing the cameo of the late Stan Lee paying homage to, you know, one of his movies. Right, um, right. Whereas in so many of his movies, he always pays homage to uh, Stan Lee. And he said, three hours later, and I'm shook. My God, Avengers Endgame is beyond epic. It's everything you hope it would be and more. An absolute Marvel Studios Marvel. I'm... Uh, and I'm pretty sure it'll make all the money ever printed, love it, and would watch it again instantly. Um, then uh, from an editor from Slash Films uh, said, Imagine the best possible version of Avengers Endgame, and somehow the film will surpass all expectations. I cried five to six times. It's the most emotional, most epic, ep- epic MCU film. A tribute to ten years of the universe, and holy shit, it's uh, the great fan service in this movie. It's a great, uh, the great fan service in this movie. So good. Um, I know from one of the local radio stations that I listen to, uh, they saw it a few days ago and said at least 10 to 12 times they were in tears about it. A friend of mine from work, he said within the first 10 minutes. <laughs> He was in tears. So definitely have to make sure to bring the tissues uh, along with us. Um, And then uh, the entertainment editor from Mashable said, Avengers Endgame is an immensely satisfying payoff, not just to Infinity War, but to all the films that came before. This is why the MCU, and I say this as someone who has not essentially enamored of Infinity Wars, WFI... For what it's worth. Oh, for what it's worth. Um... Yeah, so I I am so looking forward to it. I know for myself personally, I have an 8.15 Monday morning meeting at work, <laughs> with, uh, already scheduled, uh, <laughs> with uh, five co-workers who we are all going to sit and discuss. It's scheduled for a half hour. I'm thinking it might go over the half hour, but we're all... Well, it's uh, funny you mention that. I think I lost some street cred uh, yesterday when one of my sales guys came in to me uh, assuming that I went to uh, the oh, opening the night premiere. Oh, yeah. wow. And he wanted to know if I saw it. I said, no, I haven't seen it yet. Not seen it till Sunday. And he seemed very disappointed. Wow. But he's also the type of person who doesn't like to get spoilers anyway. So it didn't really matter. Okay. Well, that's good. That's so. good. Um, so speaking of spoilers, uh, so it seems Avengers fans cry foul over the Washington Post spoiler headline. Um, So an article in Friday's edition of the Washington Post contained a headline that in itself was a spoiler, while the article goes on to promote itself as being spoiler free. Fortunately, I did not see it (laughs) because I'd be very mad. I am one that does not like spoilers at all. Don't tell me that somebody died and isn't coming back or this person's going to kill somebody else. I don't want to know. I want to be in the theater and be completely shocked. That's why even when the different trailers come out and the different commercials come out, I get mad because I don't want to see it. I don't want any clue of anything. So it says, while the article was indeed spoiler free, uh, but that didn't exclude the headlines and fans were definitely up in arms. Uh, This coming in the Um, in the face of open letters, tweets, and pleas from the cast and crew of the movie to not spoil it for all the fans. So shame on the Washington Post for crossing that line that didn't need to be crossed. And for what? A headline of their own making? Are they the next Marvel (laughs) supervillain? Could be. You never know. Uh, For what it's worth, I did go ahead and read the article itself. Um, it, the headline was definitely a spoiler. Mm-hmm. Not anything unexpected, but a spoiler nonetheless. Right, right. Um, and the rest of the article was really just a fluff piece that had no substance whatsoever. So mm. it was like, it wasn't even, like, what was the point? Right, you know? right. Just so that they could grab Shock their own value, headline. I right, guess, that's maybe. what it was. 
Yeah. You know, they were basically trying to steal some some publicity from the movie, which is shameful, really. Yeah. So, anyway, moving right along. Moving right along. So, our last piece in the... Oh, no, not last piece. Uh, so, the next thing in our Disney detectives is our lovely CEO, uh, Bob Iger's uh, $65 million payday, which uh, Abigail Disney, the granddaughter of Roy Disney... Um, has said is insane um, that the $65.6 million compensation package is an insane level of compensation. She believes that the pay gap between the United States top executives and their employees has a corrosive effect on society. Um, She then notes that if Iger would give a 15 percent raise to every Disneyland employee out of his own pocket, he would still earn $10 million. Um, he earned a, uh, a report said that he earned, uh, 1,424 times more the median of the average Disney employee last year, according to a study that was done. Um, the big payout in compensation was largely tied to stock grants, uh, after Disney's acquisition of Fox well, a, and uh, television and their film assets, and it's and it's funny hearing this after uh, seeing the controversy at Disneyland Paris, right? With, with the with the workers walking, basically trashing the trashing the park, the park because in of, protest for wages, right? So you know, I'm wondering what this is going to spark with. You know, Disney employees, if, you know, if they've decided, hey, listen, we should be, you know, uh, getting more. Now, Abigail Disney has declined to disclose the size of her own inheritance, but stated earlier this year that she could be a billionaire if she wanted to be a billionaire. Uh, Disney has uh, donated roughly $70 million to charity in the last three decades and is a vocal advocate for higher taxes on the rich. Um, Disney Abigail further challenged the company to take 50% of the executive bonuses and distribute it to the lowest 10% of the wage earners at the company's nearly, um, nearly 20, 200,000 employees. Uh, according to the regulatory filing, six of Disney's top executives earn a combined bonus in stock options worth over $62 million. Over six executives. Six executives. That's that's ridiculous. Nobody needs that much money. No. What, you know, your house is paid off. Your college tuition for your kids is paid off. Assuming you're not cheating your way. Exactly. Your you're college. not paying to get your kid into college. But honestly, you know, give it to to the people that, that deserve it. Um, uh A Disney spokesperson responded to Abigail Disney's earlier criticism of Iger's compensation, saying he has delivered uh, exceptional value for shareholders. Disney's market capitalization has grown exponentially over the last decade, rising $75 billion in the last month alone, and the stock price has increased to $132 a share from $24 dollars a share when he became CEO in 2005. So yeah, that's great that you made all this money for your shareholders, but what about your employees who are helping to Well, see, and that, that statement money? itself is really more of an indictment of Disney, mm-hmm. I think, than a defense of Disney mm-hmm. because number 1, yeah, the company's done very well for itself. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Bob Iger is not the one that did all that work. Right, exactly. The people that 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 are in the trenches, mm-hmm. the studios, the 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 park mm-hmm. employees, your store employees, all your cast members, they're the right. ones they're that the ones allowed that you it. to do that. Absolutely. Bob Iger had, you know, I would even go so far as to say the company is that successful despite Bob Iger. Mm. This is almost as bad as Donald Trump coming into office and claiming credit for the economy turning around when his policies had nothing to do with it. Right. He happened to be in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. You know. Bob Iger didn't increase the market share of Disney Mm -hmm. like that. Couldn't have done it without the employee. Absolutely. Second point is, all right, so the company is that rich. So why aren't you giving it back to the employees? Right. Why what are you, you doing with all right, of it? Right. Why are you giving it to all your executives, patting them on the back for 
Right. Yeah. You know, when they don't need it, they're the ones that. Right. They that don't need an improved need compensation mm-hmm. package. No, and what don't. would happen if every Disney employee walked off? Are your executives going to go out there and run your parks? They wouldn't and even produce your movies, and they wouldn't even know how to. Exactly. That's, yeah. So that's... you know that statement there mm-hmm. is just as an absolute sign that Disney doesn't get it. Yeah. They don't get it. They're not going to get it. You know, the company itself is an embarrassment compared to what Walt Disney wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a shame. Yeah. And, and it's not going to get any better anytime soon. You know, Disney wants to pat themselves on the back because they're moving towards a $15 an hour wage. Right. And $15 an hour wage is $7 below the poverty line. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so you're still not. <laughs> right. So it's insignificant what yeah. you're trying to do. But, you know, they've got more money than God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what well, are you doing with it all? Yeah. You're certainly not paying it back in generous dividends right. to your stockholders. Well, and I'm sure they're saying, oh, well, look at, you know, Galaxy's Edge and, you know, all the enhancements sure. that we're making to the parks and all of so, the movies. So that... your revenue is up $75 billion. You spent $1 billion mm-hmm. on Galaxy's Edge. Right. So that's $74 other... billion dollars that you still have. You can spend money somewhere right. else. Right. So it'll be interesting to, to see but more comes out of this. Yes. Disney Detective is now Bash Disney. <laughs> bash, bash so Disney. let's bash it one more one more story before uh, we move on. So obviously Galaxy's Edge, uh, we keep talking about it, is uh, getting very close to opening. And now they have announced that there will now be a four-hour window that guests will be allowed to visit the section Um, Whereas before they had mentioned about having a reservation to get in, now you're actually going to be limited in the amount of time that you can actually spend in the area. Um, Guests that are staying at one of the hotels will be supplied with a one-time slot regardless of how many days that they're staying. Um, Excitement faded once it was revealed that they'd only have one four-hour window to explore the $1 billion expansion. Um, Only one of the two expected rides will even be available on opening day. So that's even going to compound more of the congestion. So you could be staying there for a full week, but you're only going to get one reservation time slot for your entire stay that you're down there. Um, So there was obviously backlash on Twitter, as always, um, where uh, Mikey O'Leary posted, wait times for Slinky Dog Dash reached five hours on its opening day, and Toy Story Land had three rides. Good luck with those four-hour reservation limitations on Galaxy Edge's opening day. Um, And another uh, Twitter user said, the Galaxy's Edge launch is a scam. They announced it, made no mention of limiting the reservations to four hours and only one per hotel reservation, no matter how many days you're staying there. What a joke. Disney Parks, you should be ashamed. Um, Also, there were other reports that there have been glitches in the system. So according to some social media users, several hotel guests uh, were provided time slots on days either before or after their actual visit. To, that they were planning for the park. Um, some even noted that they were giving they were given time slots for when the attraction isn't even set to open yet. Um, the Los Angeles Times reported that Disney has acknowledged the issues and they are trying to fix everything. So it sounds like it's going to be a cluster F uh, for the most part. Yeah, I don't want to be there this for, is gonna be a, for mess. a while. And what I'd like to know is how is Disney going to enforce the four hours? Because they're not armbanding people. Right. Um, are you, are they going to police you somehow through your magic bands and kick you out if you've been there more than four hours? I don't know. And maybe they, they'll they have it set up like a queue, you know, like this is, how, you know, and, and sort of like, you know, a corral, like you're going to go through here and then you go through here and then you go through here, you know, but then again, the wait time for the ride. Now, maybe the wait time for the ride won't be as long because you have this set reservation. Um, but they're suggesting that just access to Galaxy's Edge, right. that section of the park, mm-hmm. you're going to be limited to four hours. Right. So it's basically, it's four hours, get in, stand in line, go on the ride and leave. 
Possibly, yeah. That's not going to fly, especially since, you know, everything we've heard about Galaxy's mm-hmm. Edge is they're trying to promote this immersive experience, right. Being the immersed restaurants, into it. the stores, the right. characters. Right, and that's the thing is how many of the restaurants are going to be open? Is that part of, you know, your wait time? If you're already sitting down to, to eat, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, you wasted a half hour of your time. You got to get going. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they're they're doing it. You know, obviously they have some sort of plan in place that they have an idea of how it's going to work. Well, judging from the glitches that people are reporting, it doesn't sound like they've planned too well. Right, right. And maybe they're hoping that by the time, you know, Disneyland opens, you know, Disney World will have a, a better handle on it and, and it you yeah, know, well, be and, a little different. You so. know, I, I don't think they could have really done too much different at Disneyland, but at Disney World... They should have just made this a separate park. Open mm-hmm. up a fifth park there and, and turn it yeah. into a new park. Yeah. Or or they can probably even do like a separate entrance, you know, for the first couple of months. Which would have that made it's sense. Open, yeah. You know, and just allow, okay, you have your four hours here. Now you, you know, you enter through one area and you exit another and you don't, you're not allowed back in, yeah. you know, almost like a separate ticketed. You know, I'm event, just afraid so. that this is going to be another example of how Disney's killing the Star Wars franchise since they acquired it. I don't know. I guess this we... sounds like it's going to be a miserable experience. Yeah, well, we will find out. Okay, that's it for Disney Detective for this week, then. Enough Disney bashing for today. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> So on to our entertainment news this week. Uh, Not a whole lot going on. It was a rather slow news week. Uh, The first thing that we have here is uh, information about the latest James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wasn't able to find the title yet, so they're referring to it simply as Bond 25. Uh, It has kicked off production. They're actually filming in Jamaica now, but they'll be filming in Jamaica, Norway, London, and Italy. Uh, This is supposedly the last Bond film for Daniel Craig. Uh, The big news for this week was that Rami Malek from uh, Bohemian Rhapsody fame Hmm. is tapped to play the Bond villain. Interesting. Uh, What do you think? You think he'll make a good villain? I I mean, the only thing I've ever seen him in has been Bohemian Rhapsody, so I don't know what his range is. Right. I've seen him in in a couple of... Uh, you know, I started watching Mr. Robot, um, and he kind of played, you know, a meek character, at least in the episodes I never watched beyond, you know, a couple of episodes of it. Um, so I don't know. He, you know, cause he's a smallish guy. He's not, you know, big in stature, you know, yeah. so it'll be interesting to, to see what the villain, you know, is like, I could see him being the one, you know, like ordering his big burly, you know, yeah. bodyguard to so do something. Ordering a muscle around. Yeah. 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 Or is he like some computer geek guy who, you know, like you don't expect him to be the bad guy. Right. You know, right. So should be interesting to say. It, it should be interesting. Now, I'll be honest with you. I haven't seen probably the last two or three Bond mm-hmm. films. Yeah. Um, I'm more of a classic Bond guy. Right, you know, right. Sean Connery is my James Bond. Mm-hmm. Just like everyone has a Doctor Who, everyone has a James right. Bond. Roger Moore, for some reason, was always mine. Yeah. yeah. I was always a, a Connery guy. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard to measure up to that. To right. Me. Right. So... It'll be interesting to see. It will. It will. And again, since it's the last one for Daniel Craig, now the speculation, who Who's, will be the next? Well, so. and the big speculation is, is that will the next one be a female? Right. Um, there, There's been a groundswell of uh, encouragement that they should move the franchise forward uh, from a societal standpoint and put a, a female Jane Bond in there. Mm-hmm. Jane Bond, I suppose it would be. Right, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, would be interesting. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Mm-hmm. So, Bruce Springsteen uh, has re- is releasing his 19th studio album. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it is titled Western Stars. He did drop uh, his latest 
uh, solo from that called Hello Sunshine. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting sound. A, it has a very country sound. Um, it's his first album in five years uh, released through Columbia. Uh, he says he drew inspiration from the Southern California pop records of the 60s and 70s. Mm, okay. Uh, which leads me to hold out hope that there may be some Eagles sound in there. Oh, uh, yes. I can see that. Um, the album was uh, primarily recorded at Springsteen's home studio Ooh, in Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. With some additional recordings in California and New York. Uh, Springsteen described the album as the record is the return to my solo recordings featuring character driven songs and sweeping cinematic orchestral arrangements. Uh, the album contains 13 tracks, all written by Springsteen, uh, and will be released on June 14th. Um, but as I said, the single. Uh, Hello Sunshine is available now. There's actually uh, several uh, videos available you can look at on YouTube as well, which we'll have in the show notes. So uh, nice to see him get back into into the recording Mm -hmm. studio there. And uh, the next and last piece of entertainment news we have is also music-related, and that is uh, the estate of the former artist Alive as Prince, you just uh, went by Prince in, in the end, <laughs> sweetie. You don't have to, you so know, the, the artist formerly known as whatever. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, he's, he's just Prince. I was always confused by all the public relations <laughs> stunts he did. So the estate, the Prince estate announces that the album titled Originals uh, featuring unreleased demos will be released. Uh, they're releasing it through Warner Brothers. Uh, it will feature 14 unreleased demos crafted for other artists. Uh, Troy Carter, on behalf of the Prince Estate, and Jay-Z selected the tracks. Mm, okay. Uh, Jay-Z's streaming service title will be the exclusive home of the Originals album for the first two weeks. Then the album will start streaming on uh, blah, 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 June 7th on title before being released on other platforms and CD on June 21st. Uh, and a limited edition, two CD and two LP version will be released on July 19th. Um, so what's your reaction to that? I think, it, you know, for fans of, of Prince, I'm not a huge fan. You know, I, I would listen to his music if it, you know, when it would come on the radio. I never actually had you know, any of his albums, but it's nice, I'm sure, for them to to hear these songs that, that didn't get released, that were, you know, unfortunately, you know, left, you know, in the recording studio that never made its way, and, you know, kind of like a, a nice little extra, you know, for for his fans. So the project itself will feature, as I said, 14 unreleased demos, uh, for songs that Prince wrote for other people, including artists such as Sheila E., uh, The Glamorous Life, mm-hmm. uh, The Bangles' Manic Monday. Can you mm-hmm. imagine Prince doing Manic Monday? <laughs> that... well, and, that's, and that's what's, you know, that's what's really kind of amazing about certain artists who not only themselves go out and perform, but are songwriters and created songs for you know, other people. He also did Sinead O'Connor's, um, yeah, yeah. you know, Nothing Compares to You. And, you know, could you imagine him doing but it? I think know? that's the funny thing. That I, right. The, the point that I make is that he was capable of writing all types of music, mm-hmm. Absolutely. but only yeah. performed a certain right. he genre kinda, himself. Right. He was like, you know what? This kind of goes better with me. I'll do these songs. Or whoever else wants to, to yeah. pick them up. So, yeah. One of the other songs included is The Times' Jungle Love as well. We'll be nice. Honored. So, it's, it's, yeah. If nothing else, it's an interesting side of Prince that you would not have normally seen him producing mm-hmm. himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's all done with the approval of the Prince estate, too. So, it's all mm-hmm. on the up and up. There's, 
Fortunately, nothing bad that seems to be coming out of that one. No, no, not at all. So, but that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Mm-hmm. Moving on to our insightful picks of the week, I will hand it over to you, my dear, for your pick. Sure. So, my pick is not a Netflix TV show or movie. Uh, you know, you've not been picking Netflix since they raised their prices. <laughs> I've noticed that. Well, I did actually want to talk uh, real quick about uh, an editor's note, I guess. Uh, so I just read uh, this morning, actually, that one of my insightful picks from a few weeks ago, uh, which is a Netflix mo- uh, television series, uh, The Santa Clarita Diet, which just aired its third season, will not be picked up for a fourth season, which is a little depressing because they kind of left a cliffhanger at the end of season three. So now... Well, and you know why that is, right? Why? Because I started watching it at the end. So <laughs> every right. show that I watch, they cancel. <laughs> oh, yes, that is so true. Um, yes, Joe has a tendency of... Starting to watch shows that I like and I really enjoy, and when he starts watching them and gets into them, they end up getting canceled. It's happened what, like five or six times? Easily. So Easily. Ex- expect, you know, Walking Dead to be canceled <laughs> sometime in the future because right, I started because, watching that. Because you just started watching it like a season and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't matter if the show's been on for one season. Ten seasons, Joe is the killer of of television shows. Now you know why he doesn't watch shows. But anyway, on to my insightful pick. So I'm actually featuring um, one of my favorite, favorite pop culture artists. And I happen to be wearing some of her artwork uh, today. Um, her name is Karen uh, H- Hanel. Um, she is an art. She dubs herself an artist, illustrator, and a part-time Jedi. Um, she can be find uh, can be found uh, Damn at her dirty Jedi. <laughs> Stop. Uh, she has her own website, KarenHannell uh, dot com. She's on Facebook. Um, she, her art and products can be purchased through Etsy, Society Six, uh, T Public, Neato Shop. Um, she's originally from Massachusetts. She is a graduate a graduate of the Ringling School of Art and Design, um, and she holds her BFA in illustration. She ended up teaching elementary uh, school art until 2009, and then she transitioned to a uh, working full-time uh, freelance artist. Um, there have been various comic cons that she's been at um i actually had the opportunity to meet her when we went to new york comic con last year um she's done licensed work for marvel and lucasfilm and cartoon network and dreamworks tops her universe disney uh chronicle books um as well as freelance work for disney imagineering um, her t-shirt designs have been featured on Threadless, T-Fury, T-Turtle, T-Villain, um, basically any place you can buy a t-shirt with any sort of pop culture reference, she's there. Um, I actually found her when she started doing Disney princesses and Doctor Who crossovers. Um, and how many shirts do I have? I, I can't even... Oh, dozens. <laughs> Dozens. D- uh, more than dozens. Um, you know, so every Disney princess, she's crossed it over with, with a TARDIS. Um, and then, obviously, you know, she's a huge Disney fan. She's a huge Star Wars fan. Um, she's very much about uh, empowering women. So she has a, a whole line of, you know, voting things and um, various different... Um, powerful female leads and and different things uh, of that nature so uh, you know she's just there's always something you know that she's producing always something that she's working on uh she was actually at star wars celebration a couple of weeks ago when that was there and her uh boyfriend who is also an artist who they collaborate every now and then 
actually engage to her live during one of the stream. So that was that was kind of cool, too. So, again, if you're into the pop culture thing and you're into Disney and Doctor Who or crossovers or, or you know, anything kind of interesting, unique, check her out. She probably has something, you know, that you'd like. Very cool. Does she do commission work? I think she actually does. Not so much as much anymore, but I, did, I was looking at her website and she does have a contact me um page so i think if there's something specific you probably can but again she's always working on so many projects so she probably has a a wait list for that right very good very good thank you michelle thank you joe so my insightful pick of this week now i will offer a caveat that i do understand this is an entertainment podcast um, and many of the things that I watch aren't considered entertainment <laughs> by most people. Um, but for you, they are. For, for me, they are. And this happens to be one of those. This is a show called Cosmic Vistas. Uh, it is streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's a documentary series. It's got five seasons. It's not currently in production, mm-hmm. but they have produced five ser- seasons uh, with a total of 30 episodes. Um, I happened to stumble across it on Amazon Prime when I ran out of other documentaries to watch. Okay. And, uh, and I like it. Um, the show uses a collection of incredibly detailed, uh, photos and videos from NASA. A lot of it's from the Hubble Space Telescope, a lot of the probes that have been sent out to the various celestial bodies. Um, and they use a modest amount of, uh, computer-generated imagery, uh, Mm -hmm. nothing overly sophisticated, but enough to sort of provide some spice to the static images and stuff. Okay. They take all that and they put it together in a voiced-over Ken Burns-style documentary. Your favorite. Um, And I'm addicted to Ken Burns documentaries. Mm -hmm. I can't take my eyes off of them. Um, They tackle things as vague as the galaxy to things as specific as seasons on Saturn, but it's Mm -hmm. all... Celestial bodies, okay. uh, astronomy, cosmology. Uh, it's narrated by a science journalist named Ivan Semenik. I'm sure I murdered that name. Mm-hmm. Um, he probably isn't the most ideal person to do narration. Uh, he knows the subject matter for sure. Uh, he just doesn't have that... Uh, uh, documentary voice to him, you okay. know, so it takes a little bit of getting used to with the voice. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're they're all half hour long episodes, so they're easily consumable. You're not getting too deep in the woods on anything. Um, they're not overly scientific, so if you're a novice or you're just looking for something to sort of supplement, like I was, something mm-hmm. to supplement my right, my right. viewing. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're quick, easy to consume. Uh, they look fantastic. Um, it's a great introductory series for folks who are looking to get into astronomy or cosmology. Um, you know, if you're looking for the hard hitting, uh, science fact type show, it's really probably not for you. Um, so it's kind of light on details. Um, but really it's basically designed to showcase, you know, some of the fantastic work that NASA has done. Um, And, you know, to a certain extent, it's kind of a promotional video for, for NASA to get people interested. Sure. Um, So it's a good series. uh, Looks great. uh, Easy on the eyes. I like to say when it comes to stuff like this, where you're not, you're not going bug eye with all the details and stuff. Right, right. So Cosmic Vistas streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, and I think that's all we had this week, it my is. dear. Uh, we will be back next week with another podcast. Uh, and we will be back with a spoiler. Dis- unlike the Washington Post, we'll be back with a spoiler-free version <laughs> of our review of uh, Absolutely. Endgame next week. Mm-hmm. So thank you for joining me, Michelle. Thank you for having me, Joe. And thank you, folks, for listening. We will talk to everyone next week.